This is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea to the meaning of the word? What's up? What's up? Yo. So, two episodes ago, we kept saying like, oh, we're going to talk about Laravel at the end. We're going to talk about Laravel. And then we said, no, we should do a whole episode on it. And I promised I would research and I would do this badass episode about Laravel. So I researched Taylor Otwell's email, emailed him, asked him to come on. And here we are. So today we have Taylor Otwell, the creator of the Laravel framework with us. So Taylor, thank you for being here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. My first time on a Ruby podcast. How does it feel? I feel better already. I feel like better coder. I've only been here like five minutes. Welcome to Ruby. My dream has always been that one day you'd be like, you know what? I need to write Laravel and Ruby, but 10 years and still waiting. Shoes to feel. Still waiting. (laughs) So yeah, we just wanted to kind of chat with you. I think oftentimes on this show, we talk about Laravel. There's a lot of similarities, I think, between our two communities and the problems we're trying to solve. And I just kind of wanted to chat about some of that. So maybe if it would be okay with you, we could just start with kind of where Laravel came from. I was uh, actually a .NET programmer at a big trucking company here in Arkansas in the United States. And I was doing C Sharp and VB.NET. And I really wanted to kind of launch my own web businesses, my own sort of startups on the web. And I needed a really quick way to build those out. And I saw Rails and, and knew of Ruby. I had a little bit of a hard time. From what I remember, it's been a while back, probably 11 or 12 years ago. From what I remember, I was having a little bit of a hard time getting it all up and running on my little cheap Windows laptop that I was using at the time. I think even back then, I think DHH was pretty Mac-centric in terms of what the tools he used and what a lot of other Ruby developers used back then. And so my next step was PHP, which I'd used a little bit in college, just on some projects and stuff. I had sort of a cursory knowledge of it. I knew it was really easy to write and host and just sort of FTP up to a server or whatever. So I kind of started dabbling with that because hosting my own projects in .NET was a little more involved. I would have to buy Visual Studio and have to... The hosting is more involved. And so I started messing with PHP, messed with a few PHP frameworks, but really didn't find anything that clicked with me based on what I'd been doing in .NET and then also some of the cool features I was seeing in other communities in Ruby, both Rails and Sinatra. And so I started dabbling with building my own framework kind of taking inspiration from a lot of those different places, .NET, Ruby, those were the main ones for sure. And then built Laravel. And again, it wasn't really intended to be a big open source web framework. It was really just a tool that I had created for myself to sort of build some projects out quickly and prototype things. And once I kind of wrote it, which I think took me about six months, I started it in like fall, winter of 2010 and released it in the summer of 2011. I thought it was like decent enough to warrant documenting and putting out there. And I actually spent a lot of time on the documentation because I thought that would be... If I wanted it to be successful, I felt like that was sort of the key ingredient for making it successful and put it out there. And it's kind of been growing ever since, really. I think it was an opportune moment in PHP itself. People were kind of hungry for a new tool. A lot of people were actually leaving for Ruby or for JavaScript or whatever else. So it was kind of right place at the right time. So when you release this kind of early version, what are we talking about in terms of features? Because I see Laravel yeah. today, I see all kinds of tools. What does version one look like? So the philosophy was actually quite a bit different in version one. That's a good question that I don't get asked very often. The original vision for Laravel was actually to be more Sinatra and not so much Rails. The routing was very similar to Sinatra's in terms of just like a single file of routes where you just say route get and pass the path that you're going to match and then like a callback that's executed when that route matches. That was very much inspired by Sinatra, pretty much 100%. It had some features that are in Laravel today, like the ORM. It had an active record style ORM, which is, of course, kind of inspired by Rails. It was much more basic than it is today. I don't think it had more advanced features like eager loading or polymorphic relationships and stuff like that. Other than that, I had the basic stuff, kind of like validation, blade templates, which was inspired by the Razor engine in .NET, kind of a dependency injection container, and some other features. Things it did not have were things like queues. It didn't even have database migrations. It didn't have any sort of notification system or mailing system from what I remember, at least not a very robust one. Even unit testing was not very prominent in the first version of Laravel either kind of diving off a little bit right here. So you mentioned validations. Am I correct? In Laravel, 
validations typically happen at like the controller layer. Is yeah. That correct? Yes. And that was sort of a, I'm kind of having to go back in time here. That was kind of a debate I had with myself because I knew that Rails validations were typically very model-based and sort of baked into the model. When you save the model, they're defined on the model. I'm not sure if that's still the way they're kind of done today. But in Laravel and in some of our .NET projects, it's not that way. It's handled at the controller level. I should preface this. There's not really a defined place to do validation in Laravel. Just typically what I think you would see in a normal everyday Laravel project would be at the top of the controller action, there would be some validation logic there to make sure the right fields are present or the email is unique in the database or whatever else. And then if that validation passes, it would go down in the method and you'd probably see some sort of save or update operation from there. That's the typical Laravel application. Now, there are people that do sort of more model-centric validation in Laravel, but I would just say that's probably not the norm in, in the Laravel world. Cool, yeah. I've always been curious about that because we're really tightly coupled to active record in that sense. And so I like the validation options being in the controller and the validation API for Laravel is very extensive, well documented. Yeah, I think from what I remember, I remember having an explicit sort of disagreement with Rails at that point when I wrote the validation stuff in Laravel where I was kind of like, yeah, I don't know if I really want it to be so tied in with the database layer like that. And I, my goal is just to sort of make it, you could put it wherever you wanted to. And the way we document it is just more in the controller. But yeah, it is a pretty extensive validation library for sure. I think that is something a lot of Rails developers kind of run into when you end up with a form that affects a few models. Like, what do you do? You've got to kind of shove it through one model into a few others. And it doesn't make as much sense if you have a complicated form. Yeah, I think that was exactly my thinking at the time. And I was also building like pretty complex enterprise applications in .NET at the time. So that was probably in my mind as well as, gosh, I just don't know how I can make this work. And some of the applications I was building at the time where if I kind of baked the validation all into one model like that. So after version one comes out, are you still, I guess it's kind of a two-part question. A, are you still like at the trucking company? And B, what's kind of the reception in the community? So yeah, I remember the day I released it. Um, back then, some developers were posting on this website called Forest. I'm not sure if any of y'all ever used that website. It was F-O-R-R-S-T dot com. I think it was a little startup website by uh, Kyle Bragger. And I posted it on there. And I, from what I remember, I maybe posted it on Reddit somewhere. And I had, had no Twitter following at all, of course. I'm sure I tweeted it, but I didn't really have many followers or anything. I remember the first day I got four stars on GitHub, which I was actually pretty happy with. I totally expected no one, honestly, to ever use it or it to be any big deal at all, which was totally fine with me. Like that would not have been necessarily a disappointment just because my mindset was very much, this is just a stepping stone on the way to me building some other business. So it didn't really matter. And yes, the other part of the question, yeah, I still was at the trucking company after I released it. But only for about six months, like I put it out in June or July of 2011. And later that year, around December, I got an email from a guy named Ian Landsman, who's based out of New York and runs a company called Userscape, who are the creators of some help desk software called HelpSpot. And that's built on PHP. And he was like, hey, I saw Laravel. And at the time, this was Laravel 1.5 or something very early in the Laravel lifecycle. He was like, I saw Laravel and I kind of know what you're doing with it. We're really thinking of kind of rewriting some things here at Userscape. And I was thinking about using Laravel. Would you like to kind of come on board and help us out? Which it's crazy looking back on that because it feels like such a big risk to rewrite your business, which was doing well for him in this PHP framework that's only been out for six months. But I'm glad he kind of took that risk. So I left the trucking company, went to work for Userscape. For the first six months I was at Userscape, Ian actually let me just work on Laravel full time. And that's when a lot of the features that people know about in Laravel today were written, like database migrations, the queue system. I rewrote all of the eloquent ORM, added a bunch of modern features that we use today into it, added better unit testing support. All of that stuff was written during that time period. That's amazing. So there's a lot of gratitude owed to Userscape and and just yeah. like not, not just for you, just the whole Laravel community. Yeah, it would have been a lot longer for me to ramp it up versus being able to work on it full time like that. They also organized the very first Laracon as well in early 2013. So 
Yeah. A lot of that early Laravel stuff was really funded and driven by Ian and Userscape. If I'm not mistaken, 2012, 2013, is that around the time Jeffrey Way left Envato and started Laracast? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly when it was. I do remember that the first Laracon was in February of 2013 because the nine-year anniversary of the first Laracon was actually just a few days ago. I saw some pictures on Twitter. I know Jeffrey Way was there and I'm pretty certain he had Laracast shirts that he was giving out. I'm pretty sure he had just recently started it. And again, another kind of risk that he took at the time. And the whole history of Laravel is kind of peppered with these like risks that people have taken that have really paid off in hindsight. I think about Jeffrey and Ian and Adam Wathen with Tailwind, who kind of got his start in the Laravel community. I don't know. It's just a bunch of things like that have seemed to have happened over the years. Yeah. Jeffrey Way was my first exposure to Laravel because I think he was even talking about Laravel when he was still doing the, I think it was called Tuts Plus back then. Yeah, he already had a pretty big following like when he came over to Laravel. So I'm sure like he was pretty instrumental in bringing over a lot of people, honestly. Yeah, it seems like you're kind of gaining momentum and speed here. So maybe the next good pivot point is going from you're working for Userscape to Laravel is your full-time job. What does that transition look like? How does that come about? So I worked at Userscape for a couple of years, three years, almost exactly. And... Fall of 2013, so I'd been at Userscape almost two years, I started working on a product called Laravel Forge at night. I spent a lot of late nights working on that. Like my wife would go to bed. It was kind of like the early days of Laravel. My wife would go to bed at 9.30 or 10 and I would work on Forge until two o'clock in the morning and then go to bed and then get up at seven and go to work at Userscape. And honestly, I felt great. Like I guess I was just younger and had more energy because it didn't seem to bother me at all, whereas it would definitely now. (laughs) But anyway, Forge is kind of a deployment platform for Laravel. At the time, I kind of thought of it as a poor man's Heroku. You hook it up to your DigitalOcean or AWS account, and it builds the server, installs PHP, installs MySQL, and then you can push to your GitHub repository, and it catches the webhook and deploys it out to your server and so on. And the reason I built that, again, was to kind of scratch my own itch where I was spinning up servers all the time just to test stuff, to deploy Laravel apps and try some things out. I really want to just kind of automate this whole process. And then I put a UI on top of it. And then I had Laravel Forge. So that took me about six or eight months to build. And I launched it at Laracon in the summer of 2014, which was our, I guess, would have been our second Laracon actually in New York City. And put that out. And pretty quickly, within a month or two, I had kind of replaced my userscape salary from the revenue from Forge. And it just kept kind of growing from there to the point where Ian was basically like, this is getting too big for you to like have a full-time job here and run this. So I think you should just go run Laravel essentially is from what I remember. And January 1st, 2015 was my first day of working full-time on Laravel and whatever I wanted to work on in the Laravel world. And that's what I've been doing pretty much ever since. That's such a cool story. The bootstrapper's dream story. Yeah. I mean, that was the first time I had really made any real money off of Laravel in terms of open source. And I mean, that was why I built Laravel to try to launch something like this. I didn't know that Laravel would kind of become the product itself at the time. I tried to write an ebook about Laravel in 2012 or in around that time frame, and that did okay. But yeah, I just wasn't able to sustain my work full time on it until I launched Forge. So when you go full time, I mean, Forge is obviously a big focus, I imagine, too. How's your time split between working on Forge and working on the framework itself? Back then, just because Forge had less customers, I spent a lot of time still just working on the framework itself. From what I remember, I would only spend maybe an hour or two a day working on Forge. But again, it had way less customers than it does now. So that was just actually doable. Now it's definitely a full-time job and a multi-person full-time job just to work on Forge. But I continued to work on a lot of the open source stuff. And then a couple of years, maybe a year or two after that, I actually had to hire my first team member full-time to help out just because it was getting too much. And that was Mohammed Saeed based out of Egypt. And he had contributed to Laravel several times prior to me hiring him. So I already knew that he was pretty familiar with the code base and the ecosystem and stuff like that. And since then, we've hired about five other people to work on Forge, Vapor, Envoy, or some of the other stuff we've launched in the meantime. That's amazing. There's some of the open source stuff I'd like to get to. The one thing I do want to cover while we're kind of on the topic of products you've launched is Vapor. So I was talking with 
someone yesterday about this, how I look at that with such envy because we have nothing like that in Ruby. In we do in that like we can run some Ruby code on a Lambda on AWS Lambda, but we don't have anything that would just be like, oh, here's the whole Rails framework on Lambda. So how did that kind of come about and what were maybe some of the technical challenges of that? I started to see serverless as a concept starting to get a little bit of buzz in late 2018 around that time. And I was really interested in it. People are interested in serverless, I think, for different reasons. And they're either interested in it because they have really crazy scaling needs that they need to be able to scale up really quickly and and all of that. I was more interested in it from the perspective of, I just don't want to maintain servers. Like I don't want to patch operating systems. I don't want to worry about SSL certificates anymore because that's all I had done for years on Forge. And it was like, man, this would be really nice just to be able to deploy the code out there. It auto scales and I really don't have to worry about anything as far as servers go. And so I was just kind of personally interested in that tech and started to kind of toy with it to see if I could get the whole framework running on Lambda. And honestly, the the most amount of time was just reading AWS documentation. I read documentation for weeks and weeks, just trying to understand all the moving parts, what I would need to do, compile everything so it would run on Lambda. Thankfully, there were already some open source PHP projects that could compile PHP to run on Lambda. So I kind of had a head start in that regard. It was just kind of pulling together all the moving parts and building it into a cohesive package where Lambda and RDS and SQS for queues and SES for email all sort of fit together in this nice little package and it just works. And there's still a lot of improvements I would actually like to make to Vapor, trying to hire a couple new people to come on board and help out with some of that stuff. But then I launched that at Laracon 2019, which is the last in-person Laracon we've actually had before COVID and we transitioned to kind of all online events. I always think about 2020, but 2019 is actually where everything was like the last. I know. Yeah, it's crazy. Let's get more into, I guess, actual Laravel. The first thing I want to talk about is, I don't even know how to ask this question. When I think of Laravel, every single first party package, everything is just beautiful and sexy. And like, I want to use these packages. How do you even make code that's so appealing? I mean, to kind of tie it in with the influence of Ruby and Rails and stuff like that, Back when I first started writing Laravel, I was, I had just read um, Getting Real by, at the time, 37 Signals, I guess now Basecamp. And that book had a pretty big impression on like how I wanted to do things and write things and make them very nice and simple and kind of user first and have a good developer experience and user experience. And so I was sort of fresh off of that book in my mind. And I was, of course, really inspired by everything DHH had built, the Ruby ecosystem just as a whole had this kind of cool vibe to it, fun vibe. They built interesting stuff. And I really wanted to kind of replicate that in the PHP world, which was very much, I don't know, a pretty morose ecosystem at the time, just because I think people were a little beaten down. PHP developers kind of had a bad rap, was kind of writing messy code. They didn't, I think they kind of felt like the Ruby and the JavaScript slash node ecosystems were just so much cooler and hipper. And so I really wanted to bring a lot of that vibe into PHP, but definitely that getting real book and some of the early rail stuff by DHH just really inspired me to make things as polished and high quality as I could, because the rails ecosystem in general was just much more polished than PHP at the time. So that was a big part of my inspiration. And then once I kind of started down that path, now it's everything I do, I feel obligated to kind of maintain that. It's fascinating. I'm curious... As a framework owner, there's a lot of first party packages in Laravel, things that typically in the Ruby ecosystem, specifically Rails, it's like Rails doesn't support that. Here's the kind of community standard third party library. Was that something kind of that just blossomed over the years or was it kind of like you started to realize, oh, I want all these things just baked in to the framework? So it was kind of a mix of both. To give an example, authentication has always been baked into Laravel from day one, pretty much. And I knew that in Rails, that was not the case. And part of that is just because I was, again, scratching my own itch. And I really wanted these things baked into the framework because of the kinds of things I was building. And I didn't want to have to depend on some third-party package that may or may not be maintained for very long to get those things done. And it just let me make the whole onboarding experience of Laravel super smooth and super impressive, I guess. Some of the other first-party packages were built out of my own needs. So Laravel Horizon, which is basically the equivalent to like Sidekick Pro, I would say in the Ruby world, 
that was something that I built to sort of solve some of the problems with queues that we had had at Laravel internally as a team. Some of the auto scaling things that it offers, some of the sort of metrics that it offers or things that we really wanted at Laravel. In the PHP world, I'm not sure if this is the case in the Ruby world, but people are very apprehensive to use or to sort of really depend on just a random third-party package that's not maintained by Laravel officially. So like even to this day, I still get lots of requests of like, why isn't there like a MongoDB package? Why isn't there like an official GraphQL package? And even though there are packages out there with thousands of GitHub stars that do these things, for some reason, people just feel a lot cozier if they have a first-party tool that does the same thing. So I, I don't know. I don't know if that phenomenon is present in Rails and Ruby, but it definitely, I seem to encounter it in PHP. The Rails core team has had a pretty strong stance of we're not going to do authentication and a few things like that. So it's kind of been, okay, we just have to trust somebody else on it. And then I think what's, what's kind of nice though is Mike Perham, who makes Sidekick, is such a core piece of the community and he contributes back to... Rails itself, when WebSocket functionality came out, he was like, oh, hold on, let's let's go rewrite this and improve performance and all that stuff. So it's it's interesting because, yeah, we, I don't know, naturally, I guess, have to depend on those third-party packages a bit more because the Rails core team has a different philosophy on their extracting features from production applications like Basecamp and Hay and GitHub and Shopify versus what I like about Laravel is you're building stuff for yourself and then sharing it, but also working on the framework as the product in a way. Whereas I feel like Rails is mainly thought of as an extraction from products. Yeah, I think that's probably true. And it's probably true, I guess, partly because DHH makes a lot of his money from Basecamp. Well, I'm sure all of his money from Basecamp, essentially. Whereas for me, Laravel is definitely... The core offering of the business is actually Laravel itself, even though it's free. And these sort of services are just sort of peripheral, optional things that you can buy if you want. They're certainly not required. But I've always thought the best marketing I can do for Forge and Envoy and Vapor, or at least one of the best things I can do, is just make Laravel itself as attractive as possible in the open source world. So making sure it has great features, great support, great documentation. I've always really focused on that. So yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, if I had a base camp, would I spend a lot of time working on Laravel? Probably not. <laughs> because I think my time would be just kind of busy elsewhere. At the racetrack? Exactly. I'd be driving my Pagani Zonda around and stuff. <laughs> exactly. Do you need webhooks in your application and wish your webhooks were as intuitive as Stripes? It's a lot more than just sending a JSON payload to your customer's URL. Hook Relay to the rescue. It handles both inbound and outbound webhooks for your application. It records what was sent or received so you and your customers can diagnose when things go wrong. Speaking of things going wrong, webhooks are automatically retried with exponential backoff so you're not overwhelming the receiving servers. No matter what happens, you'll have the peace of mind that your webhooks will be delivered. With Hook Relay, you get to save time while also having powerful, scalable webhook processing that the experts maintain for you. Go to hookrelay.dev to get started and check webhooks off your to-do list. You know, I like that Forge came out of you're building your own stuff and then it turned into a product that like naturally supports the community. And then if you use Forge, you help development of everything else. And it's just kind of a natural cycle there. Whereas if you if you use Basecamp, great, but it doesn't necessarily make the community better for the Rails mm -hmm. framework. And I think that's a nice yeah. nice cycle that you get into with Laravel there. Yeah. One of the differences I've seen in early Laravel and early Rails communities is going back to sort of the packages and who maintains them in third party versus first party is I felt like my observation is, and I don't want to put PHP down too hard, but it just felt like the Ruby community and the JavaScript community just had a wider variety of talented programmers compared to the PHP community. PHP has a ton of programmers, so the talent pool is very wide, but it doesn't always feel as deep as the JavaScript and Ruby communities do or did. So there just was only a handful of people really that actually had the time and the skills to build something all the way through really polished in terms of these packages. 
some of the burden just kind of ended up falling on our shoulders at Laravel for that reason as well. It's just because nobody else was really doing it. I wanted these things built. And if there would have been, in some cases, if there would have been really obvious, good community packages to do it, I probably wouldn't have built them, but there just weren't. And for a few things, there are, like I mentioned GraphQL. So there actually is a a good GraphQL package for Laravel that we don't maintain and that I'm very happy to let them maintain because it's actually pretty complicated. But yeah, I think just the, maybe the talent pools were a little different as well, which contributed to some of the differences. Yeah, I feel like there's probably a ton of WordPress developers. And when you're building WordPress stuff, it's not quite this full framework that you have to think about queues and everything else necessarily. Yeah, it's definitely a different environment. And there's been WordPress people that have transitioned into being Laravel developers. And that's a pretty big transition, I think. But yeah, a ton of PHP developers are like WordPress, Drupal, Magento, whatever else is out there. What kind of led into, I mean, I guess building your own products ended up with sort of you build Forge, you got to build payments for that. That becomes cashier, I guess, as sort of a natural thing. Yep, exactly. So I built Forge and Envoyer were the first two SaaS products I built. And I actually released Envoyer less than a year after releasing Forge. I released Envoyer, which was a zero downtime deployment solution for Laravel in February of 2015. And I kind of took all of my experience from building out those two SaaSes and the payments and the Stripe integration and stuff and extracted that into Laravel Spark and Laravel Cashier. Spark being kind of the UI scaffolding front end to quick start the billing portion of a SaaS and cashier is sort of the underlying library that's powering it. And mainly because I like never wanted to write that boilerplate code again, just because it's really tedious and time consuming and it's kind of particular to get it just right. So I extracted that out into Laravel Spark, which we just released a new major version of that last year as well. And then I also released the only other paid commercial thing I think we haven't touched on is Laravel Nova, which was actually pitched to me. Let's like an admin backend panel for Laravel. So if you have a Laravel app and you kind of want people to be able to, maybe the clients to be able to log in and update some data or whatever, they can do so. But it's not really a full CMS like a WordPress would be. That was actually pitched to me by a guy named David Hemphill who lives in Missouri. And he was like, I really think the Laravel ecosystem needs this. But if I build it myself, I don't think I'll, it'll get as much traction as if we kind of launch it together. So he finally like kind of pitched me on it, built a prototype and showed it to me. And I was like, oh yeah, this is actually pretty sweet. And we kind of paired up and built that together and released it. We're very familiar with all these because we've tried to rebuild a lot of these in Ruby and Rails. I sat in a hotel room and tried to rebuild Cashier in Ruby, and it was the worst implementation you've ever seen. But it led us to write this library called Pay, which is basically inspired by Laravel Cashier. Like I said earlier, I see this stuff, and I just want to use it. So let's try and make it happen in Ruby. Yeah. And I've definitely seen other things in Ruby. Bullet Train by Andrew Culver, which is kind of like a Spark ported over. It's not like a port, but it's that same kind of product for Ruby on Rails. And of course, I mean, that's great. I've taken way more inspiration from Rails than Rails has ever taken from me. (laughs) So I mean, it's really cool to see that happen, actually. I am curious to know what your favorite Laravel package is. Oh, gosh. I mean, there's been several over the years. I think our version of Action Cable is actually pretty different than how Action Cable is done in Rails. So we call it event broadcasting. And I think it came out actually a year or two before DHH shipped out Action Cable. And it pairs with the client side piece. It's called Laravel Echo. And that is one of my favorite libraries. Just because I think it's so nice and easy to use and quick to set up and just pretty powerful out of the box. I mean, the thing I use the most is Laravel Forge, kind of the very first big thing I built. I'm in there pretty much every day doing stuff. So I definitely get the most mileage out of that. I should say some of the fondest memories I have of building Laravel packages is building Laravel Valet, which I'm not sure if y'all have used that, but it's basically a really quick local dev environment for Laravel just for Mac. And what it does is it installs Nginx on your Mac via Homebrew and PHP and all of that. And then you can specify a certain directory where all of your sites are just served out of. And I've definitely seen things like this for Rails as well. I think one of them was called POW or something like that. But anyway, you specify a directory called like sites or whatever. And then every directory within that directory is just accessible in your browser at like app name dot test or whatever the folder name is. 
that was the most fun package to build because I kind of paired on it with Adam Wathen, who again created Tailwind. And we just had so many laughs. And the whole thing was such a joke, honestly. What if we could get this to work? And what if we could get that to work? And we were just laughing our heads off the whole time building it at like two in the morning. And that was honestly some of the most fun I've had building open source stuff. Okay, yeah. So I would also be curious to know, you mentioned like Rails has influenced Laravel. Do you have any examples of maybe some of that influence? I mean, the ORM is the most obvious example because it is active record in its architecture compared to like an entity mapper or whatever they're called, data mapper. <laughs> I couldn't even remember anymore. Versus like a data mapper architecture, which would be more like in PHP, we have one called Doctrine. And in .NET, it was called Hibernate. I think it's called in Hibernate.net, maybe Hibernate in Java. That's the most obvious inspiration. But other than that, it's not so much line for line code inspiration as it is general philosophy of readability, really terse, expressive syntax, really polished user experience, really productive, really rapid. All of those sort of more philosophical things, I think, are where Laravel takes inspiration from Rails versus like, I never cracked open the Rails source and just ported code. I've never, ever done that. What I would typically do when I was first building Laravel is say I want even something small, like how are we going to tell the framework to redirect to another, send like a redirect response back to the browser. I would crack open the Rails docs, crack open the Sinatra docs, maybe crack open the Django docs in Python and just see how each one does it. And most of the time, the way Rails did it is going to be pretty similar to how Laravel works. So the method names are going to be really expressive, like maybe like return, redirect, underscore, to, and then the path, which I think was the very first redirect syntax in Laravel. So a lot of stuff that in just in terms of the general feel of how it feels to code in Laravel was very much inspired by Rails and their whole just sort of vibe in that whole framework. And again, it wasn't like I ever cracked open the Rails source or active record source. It was like, gee, how do they do a database insert? It was not really that. That makes sense. How familiar were you when you started Laravel with all of this stuff? Because if you've got to go and be that understanding all of HTTP and databases and everything else, you got to go build authentication queues, a million different things. You've got a ton of packages and stuff. Were you already pretty familiar with this stuff when you started Laravel or was there a lot of learning along the way that was like, okay, WebSockets, now I got to go figure out, mm -hmm. can we do this efficiently and in a certain way or whatever? Kind yeah. of curious what your experience was. Some things I was already very familiar with and sometimes some things I wasn't. And it's just a matter of like, a lot of those gaps have been filled in over the 11 years that Laravel's been around now. And I've honestly forgotten a lot of it now too. Some of the things I learned, I've learned and then forgotten. But at the time when I first started Laravel, I was actually already, I was better at SQL then than I am now writing raw SQL statements because I was just coming out of this sort of enterprise environment and we didn't have any ORM at all. And the data was very complicated, very big tables, lots of tables. And I was, so I was just really good at writing raw, complicated SQL statements. So I was pretty knowledgeable as far as databases go, indexes go, SQL goes. I had no knowledge of queues, WebSockets, which, I mean, WebSockets weren't, they were around, but they weren't a huge emphasis in PHP back then anyway. I had never written a database migration system because we never used anything like that. We had DBAs at my .NET job and I would, if I wanted to add a column to a table, I'd have to fill out a form and send it to them and they would have to sign off on it and they would add it to the table. There was no database migrations or anything like that. And so the process was kind of when I had a need, say I want to write, I don't know, Laravel Horizon, the Q package, or just write queues in Laravel in general, I would have to just do research for weeks just to sort of get up to speed on how other people are doing it. And that's really the benefit I've had with Laravel. And I feel really lucky. Like I'm kind of coming behind all these people that have really put in a lot of work in Rails and Sidekick and other Q systems that were already around in other languages where I kind of get a feel for how they worked what configuration options they had, what their APIs were like. So I'm kind of like standing on the shoulders of giants in a way as I'm doing all this stuff. But it was very much just as I needed it, I would learn it. And like I said, now sometimes I've kind of forgotten it. So like I'm not as familiar with Laravel Horizon now as obviously I was when I wrote it. And I would have to kind of get back up to speed. But yeah, it wasn't like I knew all this stuff at the time. And in some sense, it's almost 
I think could be encouraging for other people. Like I feel like I was like pretty vastly underqualified to even write Laravel in the first place. I had only been using PHP for four months and started building this web framework and had only been a professional programmer for like, I don't know, maybe three or four years. It wasn't like I had been programming for 20 years or anything. But anyway, I just kind of like figured it out as I went and with help from other people on GitHub and in the community, just kind of figured it out and learned it as I went. Yeah, that is really awesome because everybody writing Laravel or Rails or Django is probably going to feel that at some point of, you know, you're building an application these days. You have to learn quite a bit of JavaScript and HTTP and SQL. And like, there's just an overwhelming amount of stuff to learn, but you can always pick those things up as you go. And I think that's a good story for encouraging anybody who's feeling overwhelmed learning any framework. It's just mm-hmm. taking one step at a time. Sometimes I'm kind of conflicted in terms of web development. I know there's a lot of talk about like, is web development getting more complex? Is it getting easier? In some ways, it does feel more complex because the build tools are more complex. The amount of things that web developer has to know have sort of got more complex. And even as I was building Laravel Vapor just a few years ago, there were times when I was like, I'm not the guy who should be building this. I'm underqualified to build this product. But I just kind of kept pouring over the documentation and talking to people and so on. In some sense, yes, things are more complex than ever. But in another way, it's almost the tools give you so much leverage and productivity that compared to even when Laravel first came out. Things like React and Vue and Laravel and even Stripe and Tailwind and all these tools are so much better than what we had available when I first started Userscape in 2012 when we were, I think we were trying to build this help desk, um, of course, with early Laravel and with Backbone JS and gosh, who knows what kind of CSS, maybe just custom CSS. And I don't know, I can't decide how I feel about it. It's more complex, but at the same time, the tools have been like never more powerful. That brings up something I did want to talk about, which is Laravel Mix is Mm -hmm. the wrapper around Webpack. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, that was actually one of the first tools that was like, hey, Webpack's kind of complex. Let's Mm -hmm. put a better API around it. I mean, Rails kind of ties into that story as well, because I had seen at the time, it was called Asset Pipeline in Rails. I'm not super familiar on how that worked. I just know that a lot of people did not like Asset Pipeline. That was the impression I got, sort of was the sentiment on like Twitter and other discussion boards was the asset pipeline was sort of a thorn in people's side or whatever. So I was like, okay, I guess I won't do things that way. Cause I was trying to figure out like, how did I want to handle front end asset compilation in Laravel? And there were a variety of tools at the time. Mix actually didn't start out on Webpack. It started out on Gulp and there were other build tools at the time, Grunt and maybe a few others. But the first version of Laravel Mix was on Gulp because that was the idea behind the icon for it being like, I think it's shake cup or something like that, or at the time it was. So it's kind of a drink. We only later ported it to Webpack. Yeah, because we were like, this is so complex. We can never let users see this. (laughs) It's so complex. So we wrapped it up into a nice API. Jeffrey Way actually built that. We kind of chatted together as he was building it. And I would give him feedback on the kind of end user API. And he would kind of build the internals of it because he was kind of more familiar with Gulp and Webpack. I think that went over fairly successfully in the Laravel world. And now recently we're having to go back and evaluate, okay, now there's even newer build tools, Vite and ES build and things like this. And it's like, oh, we may have to change again, but we'll see. Yeah, that was kind of where I was going with that question. It's like Rails is shifting again. We had a tool called Webpacker, which was like Rails' answer to that. And now with Rails 7, it's kind of going back to the asset pipeline, but the asset pipeline, it's not doing the building. You're using ES Build or Vite, or you can even still use Webpack. I was curious, kind of, you said you're exploring those. It's like, do we need to hit this? Has there been any kind of progress there? I think front-end development in the Laravel world and in the Rails world still seems to be in this period of exploration. So to me, a lot of it kind of kicked off actually in the Elixir ecosystem with Live View and the Phoenix framework in Elixir. That is what inspired Livewire in the Laravel ecosystem, which is a way to sort of, it's kind of serves the same purposes as Hotwire in the sense that it lets you build sort of interactive, they feel like JavaScript applications, but they're actually all written in PHP. And you could sprinkle some JavaScript in there using Alpine or Stimulus or whatever. DHH seems to have a little bit stronger of an aversion to JavaScript than I personally do. I actually kind of enjoy Vue and React and 
we have a tool in Laravel, which you can use it in Rails as well, called Inertia, where you can do all your routing in Laravel and all your data hydration in Laravel, but your Laravel controller actually returns a reference to a view page or a React page, and that's loaded in the browser. And then from there, you're sort of in just traditional view or React territory. Mix is still working out fine for us. I don't know if we'll change to anything else in the near term, but kind of where I was going with that, I don't know if we'll end up on kind of the same path the DHH is on, just because I'm not as repulsed by JavaScript as he seems to be at the moment. Although I do really enjoy Livewire, and we actually have a Hotwire adapter for Laravel as well, which I haven't had time to dig into, but would really like to look into it. But we'll see. I mean, right now, people seem pretty happy with where things are. So we'll see how it plays out. Yeah, I think Laravel, if I'm not mistaken, was kind of one of the early big supporters of Vue.js. Yeah, I mean, that's what Evan says in the Vue documentary and stuff. This was back, I can't remember what year it was, but I was trying to learn React and was feeling a little bit overwhelmed. I can't remember why at the time. And I went to the Vue website because this person had mentioned it to me and I was just like, it just clicked for some reason a lot easier. I think one of the big reasons was because at the time you could just drop like a link to Vue, a CDN version of Vue in your HTML page and just start using Vue immediately with no compilation step, no build step or anything. And so it really gave me this really fast way to start playing with it. And I think I tweeted about it, like how I was feeling kind of overwhelmed learning React, but Vue is kind of clicking with me better. I think the documentation was maybe a little bit more easier to read for newcomers compared to React. I just couldn't get it to click for me. So that kind of drew a lot of people in the Laravel ecosystem into the Vue space, which is sort of a diverging path from how Rails' history has gone, I think. I'm not sure if DHH has ever really steered people into Vue or React or anything like that. So for that reason, like a ton of Laravel developers also became Vue developers. And some of our tools are built using Vue, like Laravel Vapor uses Vue, Laravel Forge uses Vue, Laravel Horizon, I think, uses Vue, um, Spark uses Vue. A lot of stuff is built on that. And now we actually have starter kits that are both Vue and React. So we have a starter kit called Laravel Breeze that basically scaffolds out the login page, the registration page, the forgot password page for a new Laravel app. And you can scaffold that out in either plain PHP using just like traditional PHP templates and stuff, or you can scaffold it out using Vue and Inertia or React and Inertia. So you have options for all three of those in the Laravel world at this point. Yeah. See, these are the things I look at and I'm like, God, I wish we had that. I, I think it's again, just because I'm not as much of a screw JavaScript person as David seems to be, at least from my like impression of where he wants to take things. I totally sympathize with why they're going that direction. Like if you could just totally get rid of like Webpack and that whole build thing entirely, that actually does sound kind of great in some ways, <laughs> but it's just not something I've ever been quite as averse to. And maybe it's because I'm kind of spoiled by what Jeffrey did with Laravel Mix, where I don't feel a lot of the same pain that he seems to feel, I guess, in that regard. You mentioned the view documentary, which reminds me by the time this airs, there will be a Laravel documentary out. Mm -hmm. So A, how does that feel? And B, how does that come about? It feels crazy. I mean, honestly, there's been so many moments in Laravel's history and it's hard to sort of let it all sink in when you're in the middle of it because it's all such a blur where it's just like, I can't believe that like, I've met so many people, I've traveled around the world to these conferences People in basically every country have used Laravel. And it's just so far beyond what I've ever expected or thought would happen with Laravel. And yeah, so it's just crazy to have a documentary coming out. And I think I'm honestly pretty, I'm excited about it just because I think it will be kind of a cool keepsake for me personally to have this as I get older and kind of eventually, I'm sure, retire out of programming entirely. And just sort of a way to look back and remember all these kind of amazing times we had building Laravel and how it came about. It's actually a lot of the same people that worked on the Vue documentary. They used to be at a company called Honeypot and now have moved on to a company called OfferZen. And OfferZen really wanted to let them keep making these documentaries because they thought they were really cool. And it was re just really neat for the company, a neat way for the company to kind of give back to the open source ecosystem by leveraging some of the talent they had in this regard. And so they emailed me and they're like, hey, when we were making the Vue documentary, Laravel kept coming up and we kind of looked into it. We think it'd be a really cool story to tell on this documentary. And so I was like, yeah, you know, absolutely, you know, let's do it. And so they actually traveled all around the world meeting maybe 14 or 15 kind of key people 
they went all the way to Egypt. They went to the UK, to Germany, and of course, to the US. They spent a couple of days here and we just kind of covered the whole story. I'm really interested to see it. I actually have not seen anything more than what everyone else has seen. I've just seen the trailer. So I'm interested to see it myself on Wednesday. That's so cool. I love that so much. So before we kind of wrap up, I was curious, and it's okay if there's not a real definite answer to this, but what's next for Laravel in terms of the framework or the company Laravel? That's a great question. And it's something I think about a lot. And I think when you've been building Laravel or building any open source tool for approaching 12 years, it does kind of feel like there's less and less ideas of things to build. Some of the things I'm trying to do in the near term are really kind of streamline Laravel Vapor a little bit because I think there's still actually a lot of potential there that we haven't sort of squeezed out of it in terms of getting people onto this sort of serverless PHP Laravel experience because it's still sort of foreign for PHP developers. They're used, honestly, to just kind of, like I said, FTPing files up to a server. That's always kind of been the, the old school PHP deployment strategy. So the whole serverless Lambda ecosystem is still pretty new. And I've got some ideas for kind of try to make that less intimidating to get people onto it as like a default option. In Laravel itself, we are about to release a new major version of Laravel Nova, our administration panel. And then long term, I think well, I'd like to experiment with building something that is not so tied to Laravel. Everything I've built in the past has been specifically for developers and only for developers. Forge, Envoyer, Vapor. Nova, Spark, all of that is development tools or DevOps tools or whatever. So I think it would be really cool. And just even if nothing ever came of it in terms of a business per se, but just a fun project to build an entire thing that is not just for developers. And so I've been working on that a little bit and I had to get sidetracked to get this Laravel Nova 4 release ready. But I've been working on a little application called Beep that is not a developer tool. It's just a fun little project. And I actually plan to just open source the whole thing as an example of how I would build a Laravel application. And I'm probably honestly going to keep continuing to do that, just kind of experimenting with little things. And it's a really great way for me to sort of dog food the framework in a different way and not use it to build the same kinds of applications. Because I feel like if I use Laravel to always build the same kind of thing, I'm not really noticing some of the weak points that might be there if I were to build a different, whole different category of applications. So anyway, that's kind of what I've been tinkering with. That sounds cool too. It sounds fun. You work hard. Now you get to play around with Laravel and build cool shit. I'm actually trying to hire a couple more people. So I've got that going on right now as well. Just so to kind of flesh out the team a little bit more. Chris, Andrew, before we wrap up, is there anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to chat about? Sorry, I've been trying to install PHP. Now, I never tried Laravel full explainer there, but now I kind of want to test it out. So, I mean, the easiest way to get started with Laravel, this would be good just for any listeners, is probably using this thing called Laravel Sale, which is our this sort of ready-to-go Docker environment for Laravel. That way you don't have to sort of worry about screwing up your local machine with some PHP install or whatever. So if you go to the Laravel docs and click just on the docs, the first page it takes you to is the installation page and it has a section for each operating system. So that's probably the fastest way to get started. And then Sweet. you can dive into Laravel Valet if you're feeling brave and you're on Mac. <laughs> I am brave and I am on Mac. <laughs> Chris, anything anything from Missouri before we go? I was just kind of curious, starting your own business as Laravel, how has that been? Hiring the team and growing that? This is your first time running a business like that? It can be challenging a little bit because I'm really just a programmer. I'm not really a manager or anything. <laughs> I mean, some people probably look at it as a benefit to like have this sort of like a chill kind of hands off management style where we're all just kind of working on things casually, I guess. I don't know. It's been a learning experience. And as we ramp up the team, I think it's going to be even more of a, a challenge. And I don't know how I'll approach that. You know, I don't know if I'll kind of try to find kind of a product manager within the company to kind of take on a little bit more of an oversight role and kind of for scheduling tasks. Honestly, the hardest part for me has just been coming up with what is everyone actually going to do? Like, what is everyone going to work on? It's been a challenge for me to learn how to plan out a sprint of like a list of things that we want to get done in the next six weeks and organize it all and whatever, because so much of my open source work was just on the fly. As pull requests come in or as issues come in, we just address them then. There's not a whole lot of two-year, three-year planning that goes into that. It's very much just by the seat of your pants. 
Whereas with a business, you really do kind of need to have a more long-term plan. So that's been the biggest challenge that I'm kind of working on getting better at. That's super interesting. And when you're a developer, you're like, I'm just fixing things as they come up, building new stuff that seems fun and whatever. And now it's interesting to see the evolution of that and where you can take it. Because I've enjoyed watching from the, the sidelines of the team growing and everything. And just, it seems like you can use that to really keep a level of polish on everything. Because if this is all up to you, there's, I don't know how many packages that are official Laravel things that I can't imagine any one person being able to maintain without getting overwhelmed. Context switching. Yeah, it'd just be totally impossible. Like we have one person, his name's Dries Vince. He's based out of Belgium. His whole job, that's all he does is open source. He doesn't even touch our commercial products. His whole job is only to review GitHub issues and triage them. And that's it. That's what he does all day, which is crazy. Like when he first wanted to come on and do that, he kind of had the idea for that job. And I was like, why don't you just try it for a couple of weeks and see if you just go crazy? Because that would take a certain kind of person that's just interested in doing that and kind of appeals to their personality or whatever. But he said a really good job. But yeah, otherwise it would be literally impossible because just with pull requests alone, if I log off on Friday and there were, let's say, five open pull requests across the Laravel organization, by Monday morning, there's already going to be like 35. And then the next day there would be 55. I mean, it's going to be like 20 or 30 a day new pull requests that I have to go through. So yeah, totally impossible unless you have full-time staff. Dries reminds me of kind of Raphael's role in the, in the Rails community. His Twitter bio is a Rails policeman or something, which I love, (laughs) but that's super cool. I mean, a lot of people are talking about like, how do I make open source sustainable? And I think it's a really interesting example of, look, we can build this open source framework, have paid tools to support around it. And that also makes enough that you can actually have people full time on the open source piece as well. And I think it's just a super cool you know, Mike Perham doing the same thing with Sidekick. And it is nice to see some of the ways to pull that off because it is uh, hard to do open source and maintain it if you're not making money off of it some way. And you can't quite do just donations or sponsorships. Yeah, it's true. I don't know like how to solve that whole open source problem entirely because I think only certain kinds of libraries sort of lend themselves to building an ecosystem around, for example... If you were to write a Markdown converter in Ruby that takes Markdown and spits out HTML, that's a really important library that probably thousands of applications are going to use, tens of thousands of applications. But it's like, for some reason, people just don't sponsor those kinds of things in the same way that they'll sponsor a Vue or a React or a Laravel. I don't know how to solve that whole open source sustainability problem for those kinds of libraries because they get lots of pull requests and issues too. We do, but it's just hard to make them sustainable. So. It's a tough thing to crack. Yeah, because it almost feels like Laravel or Vue is the platform you're everything's built on and you're happy to throw money at that Mm -hmm. because you depend on it. And then the one feature of Markdown conversion is smaller and you're like, I don't know if I want to pay for that necessarily. Yeah, that's why like at Laravel, I've always tried to funnel donations through to other libraries. So like we donate over 1500 bucks a month to various libraries that we use. Views, one of them, Livewire, and then even some smaller ones. Like we donated to like our file system abstraction library or actually our markdown converter (laughs) person. So as people donate to me on GitHub, I just kind of pick out a new person to sponsor on GitHub to funnel it through because we depend on so much ourselves. That rules. That's such a cool thing to pay it forward. I am so grateful for your time and that you took the adventure of coming on a Ruby podcast with us. For anyone listening, obviously, pretty easy to find you. But if you want to share maybe some places people can find you online. I'm probably most active on Twitter um, at twitter.com slash Taylor Otwell. And then if you want to see what I'm doing on GitHub, my username is Taylor Otwell in there as well. Awesome. Well, once again, thanks again for joining us. And to everyone else, we'll chat again next week. Yep. Thanks for having me.